Welcome to this Euractive online event, which is kindly supported by PGE, the Polish electricity company. My name is Frédéric Simon, I'm the energy and environment editor of Euractive, and I will be your host for today's event, which is titled Efficient District Heating Systems, How to Achieve Cost-Effective Decarbonisation. Now, today's debate on uh, heating comes at a turning point for energy policy in Europe. The war in Ukraine has made the decarbonisation of heating a pressing political issue at EU level, with the European Commission now planning to decrease reliance on Russian gas by two-thirds before the end of the year and cut it down uh, to, well, uh, to zero well before 2030. So how fast can heating be decarbonised and what can be the role of district heating systems in accelerating this transition to discuss this topic today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Claudia Canevari. She's Head of Unit for Energy Efficiency at the European Commission. Svetlina Penkova, a Bulgarian MEP from the Socialist Party who is Shadow Rapporteur on the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive in the European Parliament. Eleonora Evi, a Green MEP from Italy, who is Opinion Rapporteur on the Energy Efficiency Directive for the Parliament's Environment Committee. Hans Kortweg, Managing Director of Cogent Europe, representing the cogeneration industry. Andre Jensch, Program Manager for District Heating and Cooling at the IEA. And Van der Boek, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at PGE. Welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us today. Um, a special thanks actually goes to Claudia uh, Canavari, who is replacing Paolo Pino. She had to cancel at the last minute, so welcome Claudia and many thanks for stepping in. Now, uh, we'll start uh, this virtual conference with a series of short opening statements from the speakers and then we'll move on to a Q&A session that will also include questions from the audience. To put a question to the panelists, just use the chat function, which is on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will take questions directly from there. I think that's all for me, so without further ado, let me give the floor to Claudia Canevari from the European Commission. Thank you, thank you, Frederic, uh, and uh, uh, many thanks for the warm welcome. In fact, it's a, a pleasure to be uh, uh, with you today, is, uh, as you underlined, uh, uh, a very uh, timely uh, event uh, because, of course, uh, um, um, trying to modernize uh, the heating and cooling uh, systems is obviously essential to uh, decarbonize the building stock uh, uh, and to also to increase uh, the deployment of uh, uh, renewable uh, energy. And, of course, all these has a, a very important uh, role in uh, uh, decarbonizing, uh, but also in uh, reducing the dependence uh, from imported uh, fossil fuels uh, and in fact uh, um, half of the energy that we consume in our uh, homes in our offices uh, uh, in private and public buildings uh, uh, is uh, uh, really important uh, you know that basically uh, 75 uh, of heating and cooling is based on uh, fossil fuels uh, and in buildings uh, many uh, systems are old and inefficient uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, in fact, uh, um, um, the, the, the big problem is that 75% uh, of uh, heating and cooling is based on uh, fossil fuels uh, and uh, we therefore need a very important transition in this area to try to um, um, decrease uh, um, uh, emissions uh, but also to decrease uh, our dependence from imported fossil fuels. And in fact, the amount of fossil fuels energy that needs to be replaced uh, uh, in the heating and cooling uh, amounts uh, to uh, between 300 and 400 uh, MTOEs. So clearly it's, uh, it's quite uh, 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 an important number, uh, I would say. And uh, spinning up the replacement of these uh, um, uh, fossil fuel heating uh, uh, systems is very important, uh, uh, not only obviously from the climate perspective, uh, but also in line uh, with the need to increase the resilience uh, of the energy supply in the EU. And with the Repower EU communication that was adopted last week, as uh, all of us uh, know, the Commission is indeed committed to phasing out uh, the dependence on fossil fuels from Russia before 2027. 
And there are many different legal acts uh, that are relevant in this perspective that are presently uh, discussed uh, and negotiated uh, in Council and Parliament. And we definitely have a unique chance to act quickly to respond to the challenges ahead of us. And I would like to underline that uh, both uh, in terms of uh, energy efficiency and renewables uh, is really important uh, to seize uh, this uh, uh, very sad and tragic opportunity, at least uh, to make uh, some, uh, let's say, good results uh, and to make uh, our energy systems, in particular heating and cooling, but in general, uh, able to withstand uh, um, uh, potential, uh, uh, let's say, future energy, energy crisis. Experience shows that every uh, 10, 15 years, there is an energy crisis. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's really uh, time for EU to equip uh, itself uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to react properly to these uh, uh, situations. Um, the, um, just a couple of words more, but and then I will finish. Uh, as regards uh, the uh, recast energy efficiency directive, that is, uh, uh, as you know, one of the uh, proposals of the Fit for 55 package presently in negotiations in Council and Parliament. Um, there is uh, a strengthening uh, of the provisions linked uh, to heating and cooling, uh, and I would like to underline two elements. One is the, uh, let's say, a more ambitious uh, definition of uh, uh, efficient uh, district heating uh, and cooling uh, systems. And the other very important point uh, is that uh, all the municipalities and communities uh, with um, a population above uh, uh, 500, uh, sorry, uh, 50,000 uh, uh, inhabitants will have to have uh, clear plans uh, on how to develop uh, renewable based uh, heating and cooling uh, systems. Uh, and this is uh, very important because uh, often what is missing is the uh, knowledge about uh, potentials, uh, about uh, the situation and the potentials. So uh, many thanks uh, again for this uh, invitation and I look forward to the debate. Many thanks, Claudia. Uh, let me give the floor now to Svetlina Pinkova. Thank you, thank you, Frederick. I hope you can see me and hear me well at this point. We can see you okay. and hear you perfectly. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me at the event. I think that the topic of discussion is rather important. Basically, everything is quality pointed out, everything that's related to energy, energy efficiency, and uh, how to plan our uh, short term and long term future in the current situation is rather important. I think all the crises so far, and including the, the current one, the war in Ukraine, they have showed us that the EU policies towards uh, energy differentiation and energy efficiency should be the leading ones. So, um, as you rightfully pointed out at the beginning, we've just uh, started working um, on the Energy Performance on Buildings Directive, um, which is uh, rather important. It's part of the package of the Fit for 55, as I'm sure um, everyone is aware and has been following quite closely. As you know, Oh, there are quite a lot of legislation inside the package and now uh, one of the big challenges for us is to make sure to coordinate and to set uh, the similar targets and uh, the similar conditions in all of those uh, in all of those packages in terms of the um, in terms of the energy performance and buildings directive i'm just gonna give a bit of the sense on the timeline we're working on because i think it's going to be probably useful for the conversations and for the upcoming questions so uh, we plan to have the first draft from the uh, from the rapporteur file uh, by the end of June, and uh, to be more or less prepared and ready with amendments uh, in the summer before for the summer break. Uh, as you see, this is a very ambitious timeline for such an important file, which basically concerns more or less every citizen of the EU. Uh, but the time pressure is uh, is due to the to the to the importance of the matter and to the fact that uh, we've been living in between unprecedented times. So the importance of the directive, uh, I guess, is very clear for everyone, but I'll just uh, give a few numbers to give the feel of uh, our, our audience why we're speaking about that and why we have uh, such a high level panel even to discuss the matter. So the buildings account to 40% of the energy consumed. Uh, and 36% of the direct or indirect greenhouse emissions are actually coming from the building. If you look at the EU, uh, about 80% of the energy that the households consumed is going for the heating system or for the hot water. So basically 80% of the energy that our consumers use is related to the buildings. 
So that's why boosting their efficiency is actually going to be one of our main goals when we're speaking about achieving the goals of the green transition and, of course, achieving their energy independence and energy efficiency. So I would say that there are four main aspects when we speak about boosting energy efficiency of the buildings. First of all is the obvious one, of course, cut the emissions and fulfill the Green Deal targets. Second, the, uh, second is the um, reduce energy uh, poverty, uh, which is at the moment it's quite obvious and it's quite related to the high energy prices. Third, um, I would say uh, support the economic uh, recovery by increasing the job creation. Uh, according to the last data that the Commission uh, had uh, published, uh, it seems that by 2030 we have the optionality to have about 35 million buildings that needs to be renovated according to this directive and this would add up to more than 150,000 new green jobs created in the industry. Uh, so uh, for that matter, those are more or less uh, the three or four like in terms of the economic recovery and of course the job creation being the third and the fourth one which are quite correlated. The four most important aspects I think we should be covering when we're speaking about the boosting the energy efficiency of the building. I'll make a few final remarks here because I know that um, there are a lot of speakers on the panel and I want to also hear their contributions. So um, one thing that we need to be considering when we're speaking about those files, especially when it's the matter of the whole of the EU, is the fact that um, there is a, quite a significant difference between the building stock in the different parts of the Union. So if you look at the Central and Eastern Europe, for, uh, for example, you're going to see like um building heating system that relies on a uh, huge uh heating power plants and the transition there from uh to low emission uh carbon fuels could be easier compared to some other parts of uh, western and northern europe where you have the local heating systems so we should take that into consideration when we're making all of our remarks because this is a quite a massive discrepancy and it requires different policies and final sentence also, when we speak about renovations and um, improving the efficiency of existing buildings, not only of the new construction, we should always be careful that we are not speaking about some generic renovations, but, uh, but actually deep renovation. Because if you look at the data, when we're speaking about uh, generic renovation, it has a very, very small, uh, small impact in terms of the energy efficiency of the building. It's about one, less than 1%. So we, speak, we need to be speaking about uh, deep renovation uh, where the energy consumption is reduced by at least 50, 60 percent, which is uh, uh, quite a significant distinction also to be making. I will stop here because I'm sure there are many more things to say, but uh, let, let's give the, the chance to everyone to contribute in the initial remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Thanks, Vitalina, uh, and indeed we'll have plenty of time later on uh, to talk more in detail about the uh, revision of uh, the Buildings Directive. Let me turn now to Eleonora Evi. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning to all of you, and thank you for this uh, timely debate. So, very first uh, consideration. The war in uh, Ukraine has shocked everybody and is uh, basically upsetting everybody and everything. But the most uh, 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 quickest, the quickest uh, way and the most sustainable way to stop funding Putin's war is energy efficiency and reducing our energy consumption. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, uh, figure, in uh, my opinion, is uh, important to, uh, to, to present and repeat again and again. 1% point in um, energy efficiency uh, bring us to cut by, by 2.6% uh, our energy, our gas imports. This is uh, tremendously important in this moment and uh, give us the, um, the idea on how uh, much it is important at this stage to talk and talk again and again about energy efficiency. Uh, and uh, um, the uh, district uh, heating and cooling, and in general, the heating and cooling sector is a sector that also, based on the data uh, uh, presented by the Commission, uh, is um, 
uh, such uh, um, uh, is today so much reliant on fossil fuels, in particular, of course, gas, and uh, uh, very, very much energy demanding. So it is exactly one of those sectors that has to be decarbonized uh, 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 as soon as possible. And uh, um, here I uh, see uh, some uh, big opportunities, but also huge risk. And I will start with the risk. Uh, in particular, uh, we uh, have to avoid uh, as much as we can the lock-in uh, situation. We it might occur if we still are relying on fossil fuels, even though. Um, the proposal from the Commission is giving us the, uh, in, in particular in the definition of what is an efficient district heating, heating and cooling, is giving us the, uh, the, the pathway to decarbonize the sector. We have to do it uh, um, in a more uh, faster way and uh, um, therefore uh, uh, really pushing much more on renewables and on a real clean and sustainable uh, sector. Um, the, the why we ha I have, I'm saying that because uh, I mean it's not us it's not uh, uh, Europe it's not just the Commission but it's the uh, International Energy As Agency saying that we have to stop invest in fossil fuels as of today and. Uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, agreement, all the pledges and the in engagement that we have signed in Glasgow, again, are talking uh, us about uh, uh, phasing down the use of fossil fuels. So it's really um, uh, the, the, mo the momentum is there. Uh, we don't have to forget uh, the climate crisis and the report of the IPCC that has been released just a few days ago is recalling us again and again the urgency of action and uh, that's why we need a legal framework which is ambitious as possible and that's why also in the uh, revision the recast of the energy efficient di directive we strongly need higher targets for uh, energy efficiency this is the uh, uh, action that uh, uh, at the, for, for the time being we are trying to do in the european parliament as well and in particular in my role as a, a rapporteur for the opinion from the envy committee and I will stop here for the moment. Thanks, hello, Nora. And let me turn now to Hans Korteweg from Cogin Europe. Thank you, Frederic. Uh, let me start by expressing our concern and solidarity with the developments in Ukraine. Uh, in these unfortunate circumstances, and given the ongoing energy price crisis, it's clear that we cannot afford to waste energy. Energy efficiency must be applied at all the stages of energy, the energy value chain. And that means in energy generation, transmission, distribution, and final use. We talk a lot about the final use, but we need to look at the whole value chain. And we need to rapidly decarbonize, save money, and reduce our energy dependence. Just very briefly about Cogen Europe, we're a cross-sectoral association promoting cogeneration. Obviously, we represent the entire value chain from manufacturers of CHP from the kilowatt to the megawatt to users of CHP, including district heating operators, but also industrial users. Today, CHP delivers heat to 70% of district heating networks across Europe. Half of CHP is installed in district heating while the other half is used in key industries like pulp and paper, ammonia, chemical, food and drink, and so forth. Over the past 10 years, renewable energy share in CHP has tripled from 10% to 30%, and the uptake of renewables and lower carbon sources is steadily increasing. By 2030 and beyond, there is potential for existing uh, district heating and cooling to modernize as well as new DHC to, to be developed. In most scenarios we have seen, CHP will continue being a technology of choice for district heating as, a heat, as the heat mix uh, diversifies. Until 2050, we expect CHP capacity in district heating to remain stable, contributing up to 40% of district heat, complementing the rapidly increase of power to heat, waste heat, and other thermal renewable sources. High efficiency CHP can contribute in two major ways towards the cost-effective decarbonization of district heating in the long run. Energy efficiency. CHP is the most efficient way to use thermal energy. 
may be from biomass to geothermal, solar thermal, waste heat, and all gaseous fuels. As important as energy efficiency is flexibility. By producing dispatchable electricity, CHB will be critical at times of high peak demand, like in the winter, for heat pumps and electric vehicles, and uh, insufficient PV and wind production. The alternatives to CHP are power-only plants, but they waste 40% of the energy input, which we cannot really afford in today's circumstances. There is a big decarbonization challenge in the heating, heating and cooling sector today, which requires all efficiency and renewable solutions to play a role. CHP does not compete with electrification or renewable electricity. CHP can supply the electricity at times of high demand, as I mentioned in the winter, uh, when there's insufficient PV or wind supply. Moreover, CHP improves the efficiency of all thermal energy sources needed in district heating for demand that cannot be electrified. We cannot electrify everything. Given these clear benefits of cogeneration for the decarbonization of district heating, we call on policymakers to prioritize CHP for the efficient use of all thermal energy with the aim to reduce the consumption of fossil fuels and maximize the use of renewable energy sources. I'll end with just a fact. We need to replace approximately 400 to 500 million tons of oil equivalents of fossil heat. But today we're still wasting 200 million tons of oil equivalent in power plant cooling towers alone. Uh, just try to picture that. Thank you, Frederic. Thanks, Hans. Let me turn now to Andre Jensch from the IEA. Thank you. Um, so, um, Hans, thank you also for these interesting numbers on cogeneration. Uh, I'm Andre Jensch. I'm representing IEA DHC, which is a technology collaboration program under the IEA. Uh, we were invited to replace the original IEA speaker here as we're focused on district heating and cooling. Um, essentially, we fund uh, international research into this direction and thus have a good overview on uh, what's happening in the sector, what challenges uh, there are, etc. So, um, personally, I'm specialized in energy systems analysis, comparison and methodology. And from my experience, also with, uh, with the program, I can say uh, that district heating and cooling is uh, an enabling technology for overall system efficiency. Just as uh, Hans just said, uh, it enables uh, a widespread use of highly efficient CHP plants. It enables the use of waste heat that is otherwise lost and deep geothermal um, sources that is otherwise lost. So without district heating and cooling, it is very likely that heat supply is going to be much more expensive than it can be. Um, I think that in the current situation, we have many reasons to decarbonize the system. Um, however, personally, I'm a bit um, skeptical whether a very hasty approach is the best um, way forward. The EU said, okay, we reduce significantly by one third until the end of the year, the dependency on Russian gas. Well, that is uh, definitely a good idea. The question is uh, how to avoid lock-in effects. I have read, for example, some publications that say that we should essentially quickly replace all individual boilers with different individual boilers, which uh, or different individual heating systems, such as heat pumps, which might be feasible for um, the more rural areas uh, or suburban ones, but uh, highly dense cities should also keep their option open to connect to a district heating system. The whole transition will take until 2030. And um, it is uh, yeah, an interesting point to discuss would be whether it makes maybe sense to um, prioritize long term efficiency and greenhouse gas reduction over very quick results in the current crisis. So for that, I'd say uh, that's it for me for the introduction. And I give on back to Frederick. 
Thanks, uh, Andre Jensch. And uh, to close the uh, round of opening statements, let me turn now to Van der Boek. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, uh, Frederick. So I'm very happy we can discuss today district heating, which is the sector which will be significantly touched by the whole sector 55. And uh, working on the package, I would like to underline that we should not forget that the regional district heating is the on, only available source of heat for million of, uh, millions of households, which are mostly located in urban areas. Um, to provide you with the numbers, uh, nearly 6 million households in Poland out of total of around 14 million use district heatings and PG solely provides heat supply to over 2 million households. So on one hand, in Fit for 55 Act may become uh, from our perspective an opportunity to decarbonize district heating, but other can actually stop us from transformation or make this uh, challenge hardly doable, which uh, I believe was not the idea behind. And uh, the carbonizing of district heating should be carried out in a very reasonable time frame to maintain uninterrupted heat delivery to businesses and households. And from Polish perspective, must have in the package is reshaping the definition of a efficient district heating system and definition of high efficiency cogeneration under the energy efficiency directive request. Uh, these definitions are not existing in the vacuum and they are connected with the series of uh, other other files within the package for example other under the recast of energy performance of building directive uh, new annex uh, Third, uh, as proposed by the Commission, requires that the new or the modernized buildings from 2030 or 2027 regarding public ones must be must be supplied only by uh, renewables or waste heat, and this also pertains to uh, to district heating. So, although the draft the, of the ED using heat produced in a high efficiency cogeneration could meet the criteria of the efficient heating system, the revision of the EPBD provides other criteria which significantly limits the connection of new users to, to, to such systems after 2030 and thus block the development of, uh, of efficient district heating. And the example that I told you shows that maintaining consistency between different files is crucial to provide predictability and uh, to provide development to, to, the sector, uh, to the sector. For instance, PG proposed to extend the application of direct CO2 emission standard for high efficiency CHP to become effective until uh, 2030 and to enable to connect all buildings to efficient district heating system. And also at PGE, we focus on generation of electricity and heat from renewables. And we are exploring options uh, in power to heat technologies. But uh, I think it's worth mentioning that last year in Gdańsk, we launched the first in Poland large scale facility of electron boilers. So uh, we also proposed in order to facilitate the uptake of this very versatile technology, it's necessary to introduce a mechanism to count renewable electricity as uh, renewable heat in the renewable directive while ensuring that no double counting, of course, of renewable electricity takes place. Uh, so um, I can stop here and I would love to contribute, contribute later on in the discussion. Thanks, Van der uh, We can turn to the Q&A session and uh, maybe let me uh, stay with you, uh, Van der Boek, for um, a few uh, follow-up questions. Now, um, uh, you mentioned natural gas and um, uh, Poland um, has made plans, in fact, to get out of coal by using gas as a transition uh, fuel, including uh, in district heating, uh, like you mentioned. Now, how does the Ukraine uh, war now change those plans? Are you still planning, uh, like um, a month ago, 
uh, to replace some of those coal installations with uh, gas installations? Well, uh, of course, the situation right now is extremely dynamic and uh, it started not only uh, uh, at the end of, uh, of February, but before, as we were observing uh, uh, gas prices ramping up significantly in a, uh, in a very short, uh, short term. But um, I think, uh, well, Polish situation is uh, quite specific because we are uh, the country which has, uh, which, uh, which is diversified already and will be even more diversified. We were working on this for, uh, for years. Uh, we have, uh, we had investment, uh, we had been investing in LNG terminal and uh, now we are having the, thanks to this natural, uh, the access to natural gas from, uh, from US, Qatar, Norway, and also we, uh, we are carrying on the, um, the investment in Baltic pipe, which will enable us to, uh, to provide gas from, uh, from Norway. Uh, but still when it comes to, so, so, so we are diversified. We are not, uh, we are not dependent, uh, fully dependent to, uh, to Russian, um, to, to, to Russian fossil fuels. Um, nevertheless, we still, uh, our aim is still to phase out the coal in the district heating by 20, uh, 2030. Uh, and this, the current situation doesn't impact, uh, impact this. As we are observing this, uh, such high prices, uh, you ask about, well, uh, of course we are, uh, First of all, we are, we are waiting for EC proposal to mitigate the price prices because we as a, uh, as a company have to, have to know the full picture of European energy, uh, European, uh, Europe's energy policy and the tools that European Union uh, has, to, uh, has to, to address the issue. Um, well, you know, we have to also not, well, we have to remember that when it comes to the heater, the heating sector, it's much more um, it's much more difficult to decarbonize it than the power sector because right now there is virtually no technology for uh, heating decarbonization that would be already available uh, emission free and wooden and is not sparking controversies uh, so consider this that the heating and rust uh, uh, industry is about to be uh, is about to be decarbonized using hydrogen but it's not available, I mean hydrogen, it's not available, uh, available in the volumes that we need. So the natural gas is the only part of the solution or other investments like heat pumps and large scale electro, uh, electro boilers are being, of course, also implemented in our district heating, as I, as I mentioned. Um, but yeah, yeah we, we are not going to get rid of the gas in our uh, decarbonization uh, transformation. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, one follow-up question about uh, the uh, renewable solutions that PGE uh, is, is looking at uh, for the coming years. Can you uh, elaborate on this a bit and can you tell us whether this helps solving your problem when it comes to uh, decarbonization and phasing out coal? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, uh, first, um, PGE is uh, the first Polish energy company that declared climate neutrality and uh, by 2050 and uh, rolled out a uh, total green strategy uh, last year, well, in, 20, in 2020. Um, so new sources will, will be produced from, uh, will produce heat from natural gas, municipal waste, waste heat and renewable energy. Uh, in several our location, we are assessing the possibility of building large scale uh, heat pumps. Um, and that's gonna, well, we are expecting uh, huge investments into, uh, into this area. But when it comes also to choosing the technology, we, uh, we are continuing to explore power to heat one, uh, having different possibilities than the heat pumps, electro boilers may be an interesting option for larger cities. Uh, as I already said, we have already successfully implemented in Gdańsk. Our CHP plants uh, run on 
um, run on two electrode boilers of 35 megawatts each. And that's very, uh, uh, very good technology from our perspective. It enables a quick response to changing heat demand in just a very few minutes. So uh, we expect that this uh, that, that's going to play a particularly important role in just a few years uh, when also an access to offshore wind electricity is uh, is uh, is provided. Well, um, you know, there is no simple tool to have one solution solving all problems and all challenges in district heating. And um, as I said, they are all in Poland. We have six uh, six million households connected to the district. Uh, district uh, heating, and um, we have to uh, we have to choose between different technologies depending on the area that uh, that needs the that needs the access to the district heating. And um, I think we should focus on the on the European regulation uh, that uh, and take care of them that they should allow local communities to choose from a wide range of available uh, available low and zero emission technologies. And from transitional gas uh, cogeneration to renewable sources, solar collectors, heat pumps, and electricity, depending on the on the condition, which are uh, which are, as I said, uh, extremely uh, extremely different. Thanks, Vanda. Uh, let me turn to Hans Kortveig uh, now um, with a, a question about natural gas. So gas currently makes up around 30% of uh, the energy uh, going into district heating uh, systems uh, across Europe. So that's still considerable. Now the Commission, as you know, is drawing up plans to, to phase out uh, Russian gas uh, by two thirds before the, uh, the end of this year and completely eliminate it uh, before 2030. So how will that affect the uh, district heating sector? And uh, can gas be replaced by um, other sources, um, and, and at what cost? Sure. First of all, <clears throat> let's clarify that, that gas is, is used across the energy sector, in individual boilers, in industry, to produce electricity, and finally to deliver heat uh, to district heating. Even if we switch district heating technologies, gas may still be used upstream as a primary energy source. So switching to heat pumps, for example, or district heating does not guarantee the phase out of gas use. In some cases, uh, electrification may actually increase the use of gas power plants in places where you don't have as much renewable electricity, PV, wind, uh, sufficient to cover the extra demand. Um, the time frame is important, of course, as well. Uh, district heating is a, a key solution to more efficiently deliver heat to densely populated areas, uh, as mentioned by uh, one of the panelists. Planning and developing new district heating networks takes time, though. Yet what can be done in the short run is expedite the modernization of existing uh, district heating networks, use the highest efficiency cogeneration for all thermal generation, uh, and diversify gas supply. Uh, one of the one of the outcomes uh, from the various meetings uh, uh, in the past couple of weeks is that uh, biogas has an important role to play and has uh, a lot of potential in the short, uh, medium, and, and long run. And of course, uh, hydrogen as well. Uh, but you know, there needs to be a market in order to to, to meet the demand. Today, CHP already saves around uh, 35 uh, BCM of energy across the EU. This is significant given that the Repower EU estimates our energy dependency on approximately 155 BCM. So there is additional cost-effective potential for CHP to double in the coming decade, saving around 20 to 30% of energy uh, compared to conventional power plants and less efficient boilers. Um, therefore, district heating operators could speed up the modernization of their networks and heat sources, including uh, CHP. Um, for example, we have calculated that in Germany, installing as the identified potential of around six gigawatts of CHP per year would reduce by around 10% of the country's gas imports. Um, moreover, district heating and CHP are compatible with the uptake of renewable and decarbonized gases. Just because today you have a CHP unit running on gas, natural gas, doesn't mean you're locked into natural gas. 
uh, CHVs can be cheaply and quickly refurbished to accept up to 10 to 20% hydrogen in combination of deploying more PV wind, a city could rapidly reduce their dependence on natural gas by at least 20% this way. And through larger retrofits and refurbishments, uh, you can convert a, a gas a CHP, may it be a gas turbine or an engine to run on 100% uh, hydrogen. Uh, so there is no lock locking effect in that respect. I think I'll, I'll end it there, uh, Frédéric. Thanks, Hans. Uh, let me ask just one follow-up about this issue of uh, definition of what uh, efficient uh, heating systems uh, could look like. So uh, I understand there is some concern from, uh, from your side um, uh, about cogeneration being sidelined uh, uh, there. Uh, I mean, cogeneration from gas. Um, but. Um, so can we still consider that cogeneration using gas is still efficient even when the prices that we're seeing right now have been multiplied by four or even five times? Well, I mean, looking at it from a, from a legislative perspective, uh, I mean, district heating is recognized as a, a key solution to decarbonize buildings and, and the heating and cooling sector. And it's promoted as an alternative to less efficient power plants, but its potential as an alternative to heat only boilers is ignored. Um, just looking at the, the, the basic science of it, uh, CHP saves an enormous amount of energy compared to power only generation. But today existing legislation and even the legislation that has been proposed by the European Commission in terms of the EED, uh, for some reason, uh, power only, uh, power plants or heat only boilers are somehow prioritized over more highly efficient CHP. Uh, without that uh, high efficiency, uh, we're not going to be able to, 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 to meet uh, the, the security of energy supply situation that we're faced with today in Europe, but also in terms of uh, mitigating uh, CO2 emissions uh, and uh, allowing uh, further electrification, uh, introduction of PV, uh, wind, and other renewable energy sources. Um, there's still a lot of room for improvement. We don't think, uh, we CHP is not recognized as a future-proof solution to ensure district heating efficiency and flexibility. So, for example, the timelines to decarbonize district heating and CHP are not really realistic in the EED and even more ambitious than what applies to conventional generation. Um, for example, uh, buildings should ideally integrate around 50% of renewables by 2030, maybe it's 49. Meanwhile, uh, some, some amendments on the, the EED suggest that she, CHP should be close to 100% renewable from 2025 onwards. It's just, just not realistic. We are on board with new and refurbished highly efficient CHP uh, meeting the 270 gram emission threshold as of 2030, uh, as outlined in the EED. This is already more ambitious than what conventional heat and power generation has to comply with. So lowering this threshold and applying it immediately to all CHP will require additional energy sources um, to be guaranteed uh, for CHP operators. Meanwhile, 40-50% of the EU's electricity and 70% of the EU's heat will continue emitting more and using fossil fuels inefficiently. So our objective is to make CHP gradually more renewable, but also push for a higher uptake of CHP um, and more energy efficient system overall. Right, thanks Hans. Uh, let me turn to Claudia uh, Canivari from the European Commission because I understand that you have to leave at 10.30. Um, you've heard, uh, Claudia, some uh, concerns being expressed about definitions of what constitutes efficient uh, heating systems, um, which according to some of the speakers we heard could um, disrupt a, a smooth um, a transition uh, to uh, renewables-based system. Um, what is your reaction to this? Uh, thank you, thank you, Frederick, and many thanks to to the um, to the questions uh, uh, to the question for the question. Um, I would say that uh, what is important to underline is that the objective of uh, um, um, uh, or let's say one of the objectives uh, of the uh, recast uh, ED is uh, um, uh, to contribute to the, the to the decarbonization. So obviously the objective we have is the 55% reduction. We heard uh, 
uh, Mrs. Avi uh, recalled the results of the uh, uh, last uh, report from the IPCC and the situation is really becoming uh, uh, very serious. So it's really important to have this objective of de decarbonization in mind. So why we are putting, why the Commission put uh, uh, this uh, uh, definition is uh, to try to uh, push uh, for decarbonization, of course, of the uh, heating and cooling system. And the definition has uh, mainly the objective to ensure that investment decisions uh, are compliant with these uh, climate uh, and energy uh, targets. Um, and basically the definition is used to assess whether or not it is legitimate to grant uh, state aid to heating and cooling installations. And of course, the definition also ensures that the security um, uh, is there, that there is access uh, as well to sustainable heat supply on the longer term, and also avoids uh, that there is uh, some, uh, let's say, lock-in uh, um, uh, effect uh, that could be caused by uh, the increase of uh, 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 carbon price prices or the exceeding uh, of uh, emission ceilings. So basically that doesn't mean uh, that uh, um, um, existing uh, uh, operation uh, um, uh, of uh, certain district heating uh, um, uh, uh, needs to be, uh, to be stopped. They, they can continue operating. It is... Uh, um, um, as I said, uh, uh, in relation to new investment decisions, so that there is a consideration by investors uh, where, uh, let's say, uh, uh, which kind of direction uh, they could go in, in case uh, uh, they aim to have uh, support uh, that will be uh, covered by the state aid regulations. So it's uh, uh, it, it's not preventing other kind of investments or it's not preventing... Um, um, let's say uh, that the existing uh, um, uh, plants uh, could continue functioning, uh, but uh, it is really trying to encourage uh, that uh, uh, new investments uh, are going in, in the direction of decarbonization. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, uh, let me uh, now ask you a, a follow-up question about uh, what we saw last week uh, in the uh, Repower EU plan that the Commission presented. Uh, there was a suggestion uh, there um, uh, that some proposals, which are part of the Fit for 55 package, so the Renewable Energy Directive or the Energy Efficiency Directive, um, that the Commission was encouraging legislators in the Parliament to consider higher or more ambitious targets uh, for some of these proposals. So could you maybe elaborate uh, a bit on this and what those more ambitious targets could uh, look like in the EED or in the Renewables Directive? And uh, what would it mean in practice also when it comes to the heating sector? Um, thank you. This is, uh, this is a very important uh, question. Um, uh, the Commission is, uh, you know that there is, uh, uh, let's say, there are uh, impact assessments that were prepared for the climate target plan and for each of the different proposals. And the, um, let's say, the, the uh, targets uh, that for energy efficiency and renewables that the Commission put on the table reflected at that moment uh, what was the cost effective uh, uh, way of uh, these areas contributing to the Fit for 55 uh, uh, objective by 2030. Obviously, the situation has changed uh, because now we are, in a, uh, unfortunately, in a world of uh, uh, higher energy prices. And therefore, the Commission is assessing uh, whether this difference between, on the one side, what is the economic potential, and the other side, what is the technical potential uh, of uh, uh, higher uh, uh, targets uh, uh, as regards, in particular, energy efficiency has changed. Um, uh, you might recall that there was a study uh, of uh, 2021 made by the Commission, uh, whereby um, uh, compared to the 2020 scenario, there was an indication of 18% uh, um, uh, 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 of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, technical, uh, uh, pot uh, technical potential target or target supported by technical potential and uh, a 13% of uh, uh, economic potential. And now we're uh, assumption is that these, uh, let's say, five percent, uh, five percentage point, uh, um, let's say, gap um, uh, has reduced. But we still don't have the full analysis, so we are looking into it, uh, and we will see uh, what these uh, indeed might imply. The Parliament, uh, as you are all aware, has been uh, uh, putting in uh, um, in uh, the draft uh, uh, report uh, uh, of the ITRE committee uh, a much higher target, uh, uh, and the same is in the. Uh, 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 opinion of the uh, the MV committee, uh, of course. Uh, um, so, 
um, um, these are um, these uh, targets are based uh, on uh, previous uh, assessments uh, that were made uh, in the course of the years, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, as I mentioned, the Commission is looking into how uh, a higher target could be substantiated. Um, I hope that, uh, um, uh, I mean, the, the discussion is also ongoing in the Council, obviously, um, and uh, um, uh, so it is important uh, to, to provide, uh, uh, let's say, the, 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 the scientific support uh, uh, to the extent possible so that, uh, um, let's say, both co-legislators will find an agreement uh, uh, on uh, uh, more ambitious uh, targets. Um, for what what does this mean for the heating and cooling sector? Uh, you know that both uh, um, uh, for for both the DED and the renewables directive, uh, um, uh, all sectors uh, need to contribute. Uh, so uh, clearly, uh, uh, the contribution of uh, uh, the the heating and cooling sector will remain uh, uh, extremely important. Um, uh, you know that there are uh, quite a lot of uh, funds already available uh, in, uh, um, um, uh, let's say, uh, in the EU budget uh, um, uh, to support actions uh, to uh, increase, uh, 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 let's say, uh, the, uh, the uptake of uh, energy efficiency and, uh, and renewables. Uh, um, and uh, uh, with a proposal for Repower EU, the Commission is also looking into um, uh, other ways uh, of uh, supporting uh, uh, clearly, uh, um, uh, the transition in these uh, uh, very difficult uh, times. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claudia. Uh, let me turn now to Eleonora Evi from uh, the European Parliament. So we heard uh, the Commission um, in the Repower EU plan just now pushing for more ambitious uh, targets on renewables, on energy efficiency because of the situation we have right now uh, in Ukraine. What changes would you be pushing for um, uh, when it comes to introducing uh, changes to the energy efficiency directive? Yes, thank you, uh, Frederike. And um, uh, a very first uh, consideration I really would like to make uh, at this point, because uh, um, uh, the Repower EU uh, communication uh, was a good one, in particular in terms of the narrative, because it still pushed uh, the, the narrative towards accelerating the transition, the energy transition and the ecological transition. So that's a good point. But uh, I think that here we have to really make uh, um, and to be um, careful of not substituting a dependence of gas of import of gas from russia with other dependencies from other third countries this would this would, this would not be in my opinion in our opinion as greens the solution because uh, diversifying for now okay it's okay but uh, we uh, are running the risk of substituting a dependence with another dependence and this of course would not be the solution why at the at this moment we really have to uh, um, um, to increase our ambition towards uh, a pathway that will bring us uh, uh, towards the massive deployment of energy efficiency and renewable. And we uh, still believe that, uh, and we are convinced that a scenario of 100% based renewable with an economy that, she, that is uh, um, highly uh, efficient is possible. Uh, so uh, back to the uh, to your question and. Um, uh, the, the the intervention uh, uh, to to make uh, on the uh, energy efficiency directive in particular, uh, as I said also before, for sure. Uh, uh, I want and we want as Greens to increase the ambition and we as a, a commission, Ms. Canivari uh, uh, said uh, um, uh, the, the, the difference between uh, the economical potential and the, uh, uh, the technical potential uh, is something that has to be taken into account and we still believe and we were very much convinced that uh, it's no more uh, time for being uh, shy, it's no more time for uh, question about how 
uh, costly this uh, would be because we need tremendously we need to um, um, to invest uh, in uh, uh, decarbonizing the um, all the sector of the economy and in energy efficiency that's that, that's why we are increasing the target uh, at least 45 percent energy efficiency by 2030 this is the proposal on the table uh, in my opinion and also in the opinion by the uh, rapporteur in the ITRA committee and um, uh, in particular also we are um, I am uh, intervening on the text in order to uh, introduce binding target at national level this is also something very much important because we have seen that in the past uh, those targets were not uh, binding in particular national level and uh, in the end energy efficiency has always been the marginalized uh, action and not really put at the center of uh, the measures and actions by member states uh, this has to change and to do so we need uh, these targets to be uh, binding uh, for uh, member states so we completely eliminated all the flexibilities member states can invoke uh, in uh, uh, defining their uh, contributions and um, other points uh, uh, that are much more related to the um, to the uh, uh, discussion we are having today is of course uh, on uh, the definition of what is an efficient uh, district uh, uh, heating and cooling system. I will uh, uh, go back on this uh, uh, point because uh, uh, I heard the uh, discussion uh, uh, so far, but uh, in my opinion, uh, um, we, um, we have to uh, make clear what is today an efficient uh, district heating and cooling system. And I tried to uh, differentiate to what, what is a new uh, district heating and cooling system and an existing one and giving uh, clear uh, uh, um, um, a definition in order to uh, speed up uh, the uh, deployment of uh, um, uh, renewable uh, uh, energies uh, in these areas. In particular, uh, in this uh, uh, distinction between uh, um, uh, a new uh, district heating and cooling system and an efficient one, in the new one is the one that as of today do not use any more fossil fuel. This is to, in a way, to define what is the best in class already as of today in order to push the market, in order to push the investments on what is the best in class. Uh, while the refurbished one, uh, I tried to make a, a definition uh, that says that for uh, a refurbished one to be considered an efficient district heating and cooling system is a system that do not either do not use any more fossil fuels during the refurbishment phase, or there is a plan to phase out the fossil fuels completely. And uh, as of 2035, do not use uh, uh, fossil fuels anymore. So giving this sort of a timeline in order, as I said, to redirect our efforts, our uh, investments, uh, and to push the decarbonization of a sector, which is, as, uh, as we were saying before, so much uh, um, uh, dependence on fossil fuels. Thanks, Eleonora. And so let me turn to um, uh, the other uh, lawmaker on uh, this panel, Svetlina uh, Penkova. W what changes will you be uh, pushing through in the revised uh, Energy Performance of Building Directive in light of what's going on in Ukraine? Will you be pushing for more uh, ambitious targets uh, there? And can you maybe elaborate a bit on what that would be? Perfect. Thanks, uh, thanks, Frederick. First of all, I would start with actually uh, what the, my, my colleague Eleonora had said. One of the main objectives we have at the moment, and like one of the main discussions we have in the Parliament, is to be very careful to not just uh, switch our um, energy dependency from uh, one source to another. And uh, this is the, the general opinion from a lot of uh, colleagues, and I don't think here it's not even distinguished in terms of the relationship uh sorry in terms of the differences among the different groups so that that's quite important to know that um 
I've started with that remark as well, but I'm just using the opportunity to re-emphasize it once again, that the independence of the energy sector in Europe is becoming a key priority for us. We're not just looking how to switch the, the pipeline from one direction to another. And I think this is now a common understanding if we want to um, sustain in terms of uh, economic industry term and of course the energy sector's um, sustainability and um, security and stability in the long term. So as I mentioned, we're just starting to look at the, um, the, um, the, energy, uh, the energy performance and building directive. We're the leading committee, so uh, probably some of the discussions to the other committees that are supportive of us uh, would be um, would be more ahead in the discussion. So we are just starting our active work here. But um, my introduction and like even what I've said as a remark now kind of sets the framework in terms of what are we going to try to achieve. The, the importance of the, the, the European uh, the, the Energy Performance on Building Directive has become even more significant now. Because if we manage to achieve the targets that we've set here, uh, we are going to guarantee like less need for energy consumption. And having the difficulties now to substitute from one source to another, it's actually quite significant, uh, quite significant support in terms of how that's going to happen um, in, in the in the fire where we're working on. Because once you decrease the, the emission and the energy consumptions of everyone in Europe, then you need less energy. And that is quite significant here. In terms of what Eleonora was saying, of course, the, the, the building directive, I will call it like that shortly for the beginning, because otherwise it's, uh, it's getting too, uh, too difficult to, to pronounce. It's very related first to the energy efficiency directive, as Eleonora was pointing out, and also to the alternative fuel infrastructure, um, infrastructure regulations we're also working on. And uh, you, you asked about, uh, about what are we looking at exactly, what are the, the, the ambitious and if we're going to try to be more ambitious, yes, of course, we're going to try to be more ambitious, but also we, we have to coordinate with the other files coming through. So I will just mention a few important aspects which um, more or less correspond to what had already been mentioned. So the first thing uh, is like uh, each one of the member states already had established a national building renovation plan. This is something similar to what had been mentioned before. So each one of them has to be working on, on that, in the, depending on the different building stock that exists in each one of the member states, because I've made that differentiation very clearly at the beginning of our conversation, and we cannot just apply one whole strategy everywhere. We can set the targets and the deadlines, but each one of the member states knows the, the best how they can achieve that. Um, in terms of the... Um, in terms of the Financial support that should be provided uh, to to support that renovation and to also help us decrease the energy poverty. That's also quite important. We're we're going to be looking at that in terms of having set some of the specific targets and when we can actually have this uh, financially supported from uh, the the budget and the money available in terms of the uh, of the programs in the EU. So this doesn't stay only on paper, because if we're looking about massive renovations, which, as I said in the beginning, they should be deep renovation to actually have a proper impact on the energy efficiency of buildings, this is a costly project. So first is a national plan. Uh, second is the financial support. Third important aspect, which um, I would like to reemphasize here probably, is when we're doing and when we're thinking about all those things, um, we need to be connecting them to the other files. Like something which is quite important when we are speaking about new constructions now, renovations, is that um, the new cable networks, the pre-cabling of the new construction should be a key, um, key priority for the new construction facilities, sorry, and building sites simply because we need that to guarantee that we have uh, recharging points for the transport sector going forward. And even though this might have seemed like a bit of the minor consideration a month ago, now it's starting to see like a pretty significant one because 
the dependency, when we're speaking about dependencies and cutting dependencies on Russia, but here we're not speaking only about gas. Here we're speaking also about petrol, and uh, we should be looking at the transport sector and like the symbiosis in that. So um, when, we, uh, when we're saying that we should uh, cut all those dependencies, we should also be thinking like on a general scale, how we can achieve that. So uh, developing the charge, the recharging points in the building to guarantee like stable electric vehicle fleet in Europe, it's quite significant. And here, final remark, because I've seen it's also coming through in terms of the, the people who've been listening to us. Uh, the, the general question is, yeah, we're switching those dependencies, we're substituting everything, but we need a source of electricity. This is something which shouldn't be ignored because if the biogas had already been mentioned by uh, by the colleagues on the panel, we have some alternative, uh, probably in the medium term, short term supplies from third countries as well. But as I said, we want to isolate that. So we should be thinking about uh, renewable energy sources, like domestic renewable energy, energy sources in Europe, but also we shouldn't be ignoring the need for a base load power plant which guarantee the stability of our energy system and provides a sufficient amount of electricity we're going to be needing. And I, I just saw the question, that's why I'm allowing myself to, to put that there as well, like an option Thanks. which is uh, being uh, quite... Thanks, uh, um, Sorry to uh, interrupt you here, because we'll come back to that question later on. Okay, perfect. So um, if you allow perfect. me. Um, I just that's want um, uh, to give the floor back uh, for a second to Claudia Canivari, because uh, I understand that you need to leave. Uh, in a minute. And just very, uh, very quickly, Claudia, um, about the energy efficiency first uh, principle, which is supposed to be uh, applying across the Fit for 55 package, can you tell us very briefly how that can be strengthened uh, still now uh, in your view? Thank you. This is a very important question. And in fact, the principle should not be strengthened only across the Fit for 55 package, but it should be strengthened across the board. So this is really a principle that should apply not only to the energy sector, uh, but to all sectors uh, when uh, energy is consumed. And what is important to keep in mind is that uh, the energy efficiency first principle doesn't mean that uh, energy efficiency is all that counts is that energy efficiency needs to be part of the equation when uh, investment uh, decisions, planning decisions, uh, uh, and so on are taken. Um, and of course, applied when it is uh, uh, more cost effective to, to, to apply it. How could it be strengthened? I, I think that uh, it is very useful to have uh, um, uh, the principle covered in, uh, um, uh, in all uh, uh, pieces of legislation uh, so that this is something, wherever relevant, obviously. So this is something that uh, should be uh, uh, that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, so this is uh, something we are looking into uh, from uh, um, uh, from the side of uh, uh, DGNR. Um, and I know that uh, um, uh, the Parliament uh, is very much looking into this uh, 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 as well. Um, another way of uh, strengthening uh, um, is uh, to, um, let's say, for the Commission to um, uh, look into the possibility of having uh, uh, more specific uh, guidances. You know that uh, there was a recommendation adopted at the end of September last year. Um, a recommendation to the member state and uh, um, uh, attached to, to it uh, there were uh, guidances on how to uh, more concretely apply the principles. In the launching event uh, um, uh, that was where Commissioner Simpson uh, uh, presented this recommendation and guidance, uh, there was the request from the floor from various parts uh, to have uh, dedicated guidance uh, for different uh, sectors uh, because uh, of course, they have uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, characteristics, uh, different structures, and so on. So this is something we are looking into uh, in in my unit uh, to see whether um, there is any possibility to, um, uh, let's say, to to come up with these uh, uh, guidances. And of course, uh, uh, let's say the um, um, uh, last, but certainly not least, uh, uh, the reinforced. Uh, um, uh, article uh, um, on the energy efficiency first principle in the ED recast directive uh, is a very important uh, legal uh, uh, basis uh, for the application of, uh, of the principle. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we count uh, on, uh, on it to be uh, useful uh, for, for the future uptake uh, of energy efficiency uh, more across the board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. And uh, thanks again for joining us uh, at the very last minute. Uh, today. 
Uh, we wish you a very good day indeed. Well, bye bye. Um, now turning to uh, Andre uh, Jens, because we haven't heard um, uh, about you uh, uh, so far. Uh, so, uh, Andre, uh, you've heard the European Commission is now drawing up plans to replace uh, gas uh, as much as possible, uh, Russian gas as much as possible, uh, before the end of the year and completely eliminated uh, uh, by 2030. Now, um, can you tell us whether, according to you, uh, this gas can be replaced uh, by other sources of gas? What would be the cost, uh, in your view, uh, of doing it? Or are you looking also at other uh, means, like uh, savings, which could come from district heating, for example? Okay, uh, so thank you for, for your question. Uh, I think it will be challenging to replace all the gas at once. Uh, as we've seen, even if we try to get maximum, the aim is 30% independence uh, by the end of the year and until 2030 it's still eight years to go. So um, even ambitious plans require time. Uh, I would agree with uh, Hans that CHP is a technology that can easily uh, help to reduce the dependency on gas quickly. So essentially we use the same fuel, uh, we just do it better. Uh, the reduction in emissions and, and resource consumption using uh, high efficiency CHP instead of boilers uh, is in the order of magnitude of 50%. So essentially we can halve the gas demand without, without using renewables that might not yet be, um, let's say, deployable in a sufficient speed. Uh, personally, I definitely would vote for um, a transition to renewables and to greenhouse gas free sources as quickly as possible. But um, as we know, that can come very expensive for the society. So um, it's kind of a balancing act. Um, there are some interesting new technologies on the horizon that promise to provide um, uh, the the base load that the heat networks need and the heat sector in general uh, for example there is a new technology uh, developed uh, that uses deep geothermal heat but does not need a certain hydro uh, yeah um, what's it called aquifer underground so essentially it could work everywhere it has um, about 200 megawatts per two football fields uh, it can uh, get up from the ground and also CHP can be used to produce power and heat uh, from that um, technology. However, it's a very expensive one since all the costs are upfront, but you have no operation costs or very low operation costs at the, uh, in the next 30 years. So there are promising developments. Uh, however, I think it's a very big challenge on the one hand to deploy technologies, but on the other hand also to deploy the right technologies and with right i mean the ones that really protect the climate um, from a scientific perspective there are still some let's say uh, gaps in the assessment of efficiency and of uh, greenhouse gas emissions for greenhouse gas emissions we're currently usually just looking at a hundred year time scale but if we want to be carbon neutral a 20 year time scale would probably be much more uh, feasible or at least additionally uh, necessary. Also in terms of energy, some uh, I heard um, that electro boilers, for example, are a uh, very flexible technology, which is true. However, even though it has a high energy efficiency, uh, it has a very low exergy efficiency and exergy is essentially, yeah, uh, resource exergy is essentially what we use. Uh, energy is just converted from one form to another so uh, we use valuable energy and uh, transforming valuable energy without any let's say intermediate step into heating which is low value energy is a quite loss uh, yeah a process that has lots of losses and heat pumps for example and chp demonstrate how these losses can be mitigated by not directly going from a high value source to a low value source so how to replace gas? Um, I think 
it is very smart to think it through very thoroughly to avoid uh, lock-in effects. For example, a quick change, let's say, to electro boilers from gas might seem like a good idea, but in the long run, it's probably not. Um, and uh, focus on reaching total independence of gas as soon as possible instead of uh, trying to yeah to have overly ambitious short-term goals that might lead to lock-in effects. Andrei Jens, um, um, a follow-up question for you uh, coming uh, from the audience. There's a quite a lot. Of, there's quite a lot of questions uh, actually focusing on a nuclear power and whether that uh, could be used for district heating and in particular uh, small modular reactors. Andre Jens, what is your view about this? So yeah, that's a, that's a very controversial topic as probably everybody knows in Germany we phase out uh, <laughs> the nuclear power plants just in time before the gas price crisis, so <laughs> it's a bit challenging. Um, there are different opinions on this. Um, environmental agencies often say that the costs of nuclear power plants are usually played down. So um, while they seem cheap, if you assess the costs correctly, they're not cheap at all. And all renewables are much cheaper. Um, on the other hand, um, it is a fossil free energy source that can reduce climate impact. Um, so if it were possible to build nuclear reactors that do not um, come with lots of uh, very dangerous side effects, such as um, potential nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, explosions, uh, it might be a technology. And for example, in IEADHC, we have some members who are looking into this technology um, as a means to supply district heating. As Hans said, um, CH is independent from the fuel. So it can be used for nuclear, for fossil, for geothermal, all types of thermal sources, uh, all uh, types of uh, high uh, grade uh, energy sources. And so, yes, um, theoretically, nuclear power could be used to decarbonize the energy system as a part, but it needs to be a very safe because it can be very dangerous and the costs need to be realistically assessed and also the building time because there are some reactors that have huge delays in building time so it might just be uh, uh, something to distract from the need to act quickly. Yes, let me turn uh, back to Van der um, uh, for a question about the alternatives uh, there. You didn't mention uh, uh, nuclear at all, uh, Van der, and I see a lot of questions in the chat are about uh, nuclear. We know there are plans in, in Poland to get some nuclear out, but there are other alternatives as well, like uh, geothermal, we just heard, uh, solar, uh, there's also um, a number of um, other technologies like large-scale heat pumps. Can you maybe give us uh, some uh, of your insights about the, the technology mix uh, that you're looking at uh, at PGE going forward? Uh, thank you. Well, yeah, I haven't mentioned about the uh, nuclear power in my uh, contribution as in Poland you probably probably know we don't have a nuclear, a nuclear power plant and actually of course we can see that um, around the world nuclear power plants are on the cusp of uh, recovery and um, you know this recently approach toward, uh, toward nuclear, power, uh, nuclear power plants and nuclear energy has completely uh, has completely changed. Nevertheless, here in Poland and from PG perspective, uh, we uh, we are focusing on uh, on decarbonizing and, uh, and uh, investment into um, into gas because we don't have a nuclear power plant yet. And of course, according to our governmental uh, strategies, uh, there are plans to build one and to. Uh, to to terminate the building and provide the energy from nuclear uh, from a new built nuclear power plant uh, plant in the midst of uh, uh, of um, 30s 
but still it's 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 gonna take time so uh, right now we are in the on our path to uh, to provide uh, to 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 lower em uh, emissivity uh, in our uh, chps and uh, in the district heating as a whole uh, so the first step is to transform uh, transform our coal reliant uh, installation into into uh, gas one and as i told you previously previously we have uh, right now because that situation has changed throughout the years recent years we are not so in, uh, so dependent on uh, russia uh, as we uh, as we as we used to be uh, so, uh, so so i think more or less that's the the answer to the question about the about the nuclear power power plants and nuclear energy of course in the future in the future uh, once we already in poland uh, have the nuclear power uh, nuclear nuclear power plants or as a um, smr uh, technology is going to develop we we were sh for sure we will uh, uh, we will use it in our in our strategy uh, for from our perspective this this decade i mean to, uh, i mean till 2030 going to be very um uh, very challenging uh, a lot of investments um analyzing different technologies to to be implemented to uh, replace the coal at the same time providing the uh, the services which uh, our society uh, society, uh, society needs uh, and I think that uh, closer to 2030, and once we will observing the uh, development and the build a construction process of uh, of the nuclear power power plant in Poland, we will to adjust. We will be adjusting our strategy to the to the to the situation. But uh, but well, I think it's also final remarks. So I allow myself to. Um, to, to wrap up my statement, statement with some other thing that I would like to highlight in the end. Um, I understand that this is the time for whole Europe to, um, well, pull ourselves together to strengthen the ambition, uh, to strengthen the ambition. But uh, my call for people in charge, for European Union institution is to, uh, to take care of the strategy you are imposing remain doable uh, from the perspective of the companies which will be uh, from the entities and companies which will be uh, forced to implement it because uh, and that's uh, that, that goes back to the uh, necessary time frame that we uh, that we need to for example uh, replace uh, ga uh, Coal, uh, coal installation with the gas adjusted one. Um, for example, right now we are all our installation are being adjusted to them are getting rid of the coal, but it's gonna take time and we're gonna fully uh, fully um, get rid of the coal in the district heating system at uh, in 2030. So, for example, in a, from our perspective, it's very important to keep the status of uh, energy efficiency installation, and uh, um, and, uh, and so we could have an access to the to the funds to modernize and to uh, to lower emissivity uh, in 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 the sector. Yeah, cool stuff. Thanks, uh, Svetlana Penkova. You were asking for the floor uh, a few minutes ago. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Frederick. It was more related to some of the, the aspects you brought up in terms of nuclear, because this is, as I said, a topic that has been quite uh, actively discussed currently. I just wanted to add something to what uh, uh, Jens was actually saying. Um, so, because you specifically asked about the SMRs and uh, the big power plants, uh, if this can be used to substitute and supply more electricity for the heating and building infrastructure. So, first of all, the big power plants, uh, they are more efficient in the sense of providing that type of electricity just because it's a centralized system. It's uh, in terms of the the price for construction and the final price of the product afterwards is definitely uh, much more efficient than SMRs. Uh, and in terms of SMRs, you're going to need 
quite a lot in Europe to be able to cover the, the demand of electricity. And it goes back to the, to the, to the safety requirements and to the safety measures as they were rightfully uh, brought up. Uh, and also just uh, to remarks at the end, the technology at the moment is developing quite strongly. Uh, we are working on a few uh, more technical papers also in the parliament to see in terms of the safety requirements and the disposal of the waste, uh, the composition of the nuclear waste, which are, have been the, the general considerations in the past few years. And it seems that there is quite a significant uh, scientific development in that area. So maybe some of those issues might be resolved in the near future just something to know and also when we're discussing in terms of like if we're going to be developing that uh, which is uh, being considered by a few countries at the moment i would re-emphasize again on the point that we have to try to keep the technology um in europe and we do have the expertise uh, we do have the traditions uh in that and uh Switching to or even considering SMRs is again taking all the way the technological development away from Europe because those um, those types of uh, power plants are not being uh, developed on the continent for various reasons. The first one is uh, non-efficiency, not applicability in in Europe. So I would uh, I would suggest to to stick to domestic European technologies rather than to switching our dependencies from the east uh, to the west. Thanks, Vitalina. We're getting closer to the end of this event, and so I'll put a last uh, question. Um, hopefully, each one of you can say something briefly about this. It's, a, it's an issue that comes up almost all the time when talking about district heating is the need to de-risk investments, because district heatings are projects which take a lot of time uh, to develop, and they come in competition with other solutions like individual heating systems, for example, which at the end of the day could end up being cheaper or receiving more um, attention from policymakers. So let me start with you, uh, Andre uh, Jentsch. Uh, what, in your view, could policymakers do uh, in the European Union to help de-risk uh, those investments? Um, there's um, some interesting research going on in that uh, direction. So uh, I think I heard of green bonds, for example. Also, um, if we have a legal framework that is um, guaranteed to last a certain time, or at least not make the situation economically worse, that would help a big deal. In Germany, we had some issues with um, uh, legislation going uh, back and forth and thus raising insecurity in investment. So what we need is a very clear commitment to deployment of district heating. Uh, in Germany, I think we need at least 1 billion a year of subsidies uh, now to expand the networks so they're ready for 2030 energy transition to fully renewables or to largely renewables. So, um, yeah, funding and a stable legal framework, I think, is needed. Thanks, uh, thanks, Andre. Let me turn to Hans Kortweg now about uh, de-risking investment in district heating. Certainly, thank you, Frederik. Uh, we'll need certainly uh, integrated planning at a local level, where we focus on the entire energy system, not looking at it from a silo to silo to silo, taking into account heat, electricity, uh, gas networks optimization. Uh, this will ensure that we take into account all the available energy resources, um, maximizing renewables across all energy vectors and ensuring that those renewables are efficiently used. Uh, you're going to hear this from many lobbyists in Brussels, but we need a predictable policy framework with ambitious but achievable objectives for CHP and district heating. A switch to renewable or decarbonized energy sources is a fact not simple and not quick. Therefore, a transitional period must be foreseen to reach uh, higher shares of renewables and moreover, uh, reasonable grandfathering rules uh, must be foreseen to reach higher shares of renewables. Uh, just reacting quickly to Claudia Canavari on that point, new high efficiency CHP criteria in the recasted EED applies to all existing CHP. There is no transitional period. That means the 270 threshold applies to all high efficient CHP. We're proposing that it applies to new and refurbished CHP as of 2030. You can't just simply apply stringent thresholds immediately without some grandfathering positions. So in some cases, you're going to lose high efficiency status. You will lose 
uh, districating cooling CHPs and reverting to fossil boilers and polluting electricity from the grid. Thanks, Hans. Uh, let me turn to uh, Van der Berg about um, the, uh, the de-risking of investments. What are your uh, thoughts on this uh, to conclude? Well, um, I think that uh, f from our perspective, uh, it's uh, important to have an, a constant, uh, constant access to the uh, to the financing, to the external financing, and also to European funds. So that will be significant, uh, significant part of the risking the, our investments because once we're gonna be deprived the energy efficiency installation status, we. Uh, we will have we will have to grapple with uh, uh, huge uh, huge obstacle which will stop us from moderni uh, modernizing our uh, our our investment. So um, from Polish perspective, or at least from PG perspective, this is the main uh, this is uh, this is the main obstacle because, as I already said, uh, well. We are already already diversifying. Uh, we, we are all, already diversified. I mean, Poland as a whole, um, when it comes to when it comes to when when it comes to uh, gas uh, sources uh, suppliers. So yeah, I think that uh, from from our perspective, the crucial part is to remain uh, to 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 adjust or to reshape uh, energy efficiency definition. Um, and in, 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 so we could not in the in this transition period. So we would not be deprived of the, the stages. Thanks, Van der Berg. And some very quick final thoughts now from our two lawmakers, starting with Eleonora Evi. Yes, thank you. Well, I would say first and foremost, uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, we have to vote down and object the delegated act uh, that put uh, nuclear and gas as a sustainable investment in the taxonomy. These uh, as a very in order to give not the confusion uh, to the market, but give clarity on what investments are um, uh, useful today to uh, to to, um, to to face the climate crisis. Uh, pushing on energy communities uh, and uh, even in the district uh, heating and cooling systems uh, and uh, last point uh, funding of course as has already by other um, uh, panelists uh, we have to introduce uh, a new funding a new fund a new facility like the one we introduced for the COVID-19 crisis on an energy uh, basis thank you thanks Eleonora and turning to Svetlina Pinkovos for some very quick final thoughts very quick um, at the end i think everything around us now shows us that we need to rely more on domestic energy production improve our energy savings and i think all the topics and all the speakers had touched upon and agreed on that point so i'm sure we're going to be able to to be practical and practical and to cooperate together between the regulations and the industry to have to achieve that as soon as possible Thanks, Zetelina. I think this wraps up today's event. A big thanks to PGE for supporting it, and a big thanks to our speakers for joining today, as well as our audience for following us. If you missed the beginning of this debate, you can watch it again, uh, watch it again on YouTube and other social media platforms. And if you'd like to know more about upcoming events um, at Your Active, just visit our websites, www.events.youractive.com for more. We hope to see you again soon. In the meantime, take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.